Hello. Today's episode is a conversation with Brian Kennedy, who is a percussionist, drummer, and music educator in the Los Angeles area. Brian and I met several years ago playing a production of Legally Blonde, the musical at UC Irvine, and we get into a cool conversation on this episode about his practice as a musician, where percussion and classical music fits into his world versus drum set and rock playing and pit orchestra work, as well as music pedagogy. But before we get to that, just a few announcements. I will be playing a show at Wanderlust Wine Company in Austin, Texas on Friday, July 22nd. And then on August 1st, I will be playing with Sap and Claw Elixir at Vine in Long Beach, California. And then on August 2nd, I'm going to also be playing with Sap and Claw Elixir at Redwood Bar and Grill in Los Angeles. And on August 4th, Fourth, I will be playing at the Mint in Los Angeles with Sap and Claw Elixir. So if you are out in the LA area, there's lots of chances to see me play, so come on out. Also, just a note about my practice as a musician and podcaster, I operate on a value-for-value model, which means that value that I provide to you through my content, I ask that you respond by providing value in kind. And there are several ways to do that. Value can be money, but it can be other things. It can be leaving a comment. It can be sharing my content. It can be liking. It can be subscribing. All of these things will contribute to the value of my content. And then we can have kind of a feedback loop going back and forth. However, if you would like to support money, I always appreciate that. And the easiest ways to do that are through Venmo through Bitcoin QR, or you can subscribe on a monthly basis to my Patreon and get access to extra bonus material. Welcome to Music in Mind, Music in Mind, with Anthony Coffey. Hello, everybody. This is Brian Kennedy. He's a percussionist and drummer, uh, musician around the LA area, and we met... 2018, 2019, something like that, mm-hmm. playing a production of Legally Blonde at UC Irvine. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, how's life? Uh, life's been pretty good. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a musician that made it through COVID, so I feel like I have a lot to be <laughs> thankful for. And uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm here practicing. Nice. Oh, gotta fix this. Oh, yeah. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, keep going. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I made it through all that, and I'm still here working in L.A., and, you know, I'm pretty grateful for what I have, and, yeah, nice. just rolling through. Cool, cool, cool. So, when we played together, you were you were on drums. Yes. Um, but we were just talking a little bit before the, uh, the, the podcast about going out to Austin to audition with, uh, with orchestra stuff, so... Is your practice, would you say, sort of equally focused, or are you a classical musician, or where would you put yourself in the Ooh. world of music? Yeah, man, that's that's tough, because especially when it comes to like just my practice, it will vary a lot, yeah. depending on what work I'm getting currently, but um, yeah, I, t- I tend to market myself more as like the classical musician, the orchestra player, uh-huh. the studio player, just because, uh, you know, I got my degrees in that. Mm-hmm. And even though I've I've done lots and lots of work on drum set, um, you know, people, especially now in the LA scene, um, mostly it's just been orchestra work, and right? That kind right, of stuff. Right. So cool. So has it yeah. been a lot of orchestra work lately? Um, yeah, this past year, like the the first year coming out of COVID, that was the majority of my work actually, which was. Uh, so I have my position with Long Beach Symphony, which is okay. uh, where I play, mm-hmm. and that's like a spot that's just for me. Nice. And then um, I also got to play with Santa Barbara a little bit, okay, uh, which is a great symphony. And then uh, I played with Pacific Symphony for the first time. Oh, cool! And that's like a pretty well-known group yeah, out very here. Good. Yeah, so that's so awesome. Things, yeah. So you studied classical uh, percussion. Then. Yes. Okay, where was that? Uh, so I did my undergrad at Cal State Fullerton okay, and, you know, state school and, uh, did my time there. And then, uh, I was, I was auditioning around after that, trying to get into grad school. I really wanted to stay here, uh-huh. but, you know, trying to get into USC was, was pretty tough Oof. for me. Yeah, I mean, that's a hard one. And it just, it never worked out. And okay. uh, finally my teacher was like, Hey, why don't you try another school? And that year I went all over the place auditioning and uh-huh. actually made it into a few schools and cool. ended up going to Boston University. Oh, nice. Did my Very master's cool. out there for two years. And that was great. I yeah. mean, 
not only like the facilities were awesome, the the teachers were great, they're Boston Symphony mm-hmm. guys, but like really the best thing, uh, which was I kind of thought it would be good, but I had no idea how good was uh, actually the lack of work, the lack of gigs that I had. Um, oh, because interesting. Hear me, hear me out, hear okay, me out okay. because that summer um, I was like doing a just a little like fill-in job working in the food court at the university. But okay. the rest of my time was all just practice. Practice. Like, okay. I hit it so hard that summer because, wow, uh, you know that was the whole reason I was out there to get better. And so, like the main mm-hmm. focus that summer in between my two years was just. So was that a choice then on your part to not gig? Because I'm sure Boston has tons of gigging opportunities. There's there's tons of opportunities and there's even more players. I bet because you have so many music schools out yep, there. Yep. It's just and it's such a small uh-huh. you know it's a pretty small scene relative to how many people sure. are studying music out yep. there. Uh, so it wasn't exactly my full choice, but. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, as far as orchestra work, I wasn't going to get anything with Boston Symphony <laughs> or or even the they have a sure. Boston Philharmonic as well, but it's okay. mostly reserved for people who have been out there for more than two years. I see, I see. Cool. Um, and I, I did some playing at jazz. Like, there's actually a great jazz scene out there. And, right. you know, I, I subbed in for some guys here and there. But, you know, really, I, I was kind of thinking in my head, like, unless it pays really well, I, I just want to practice. And okay. That's what I did, and I'm I'm so thankful for that time. It really like uh-huh. kind of boosted me up. That's amazing. From where I was at, yeah. It it actually brings up a lot of que- questions that I talk about on the show a lot about the value of music in higher education and things like graduate degrees. And it's I go back and forth on it all the time. I'm sort of on the fence about what yeah. what is the value of of music in higher education because in a sense. I tend to see music as not really belonging in a university, mm-hmm. but a lot of universities try and set up their music departments, not all, sort of as in conservatory style. And I don't know how BU does it, but I, but there is Boston Conservatory and there's NEC and mm-hmm. uh, Berkeley, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so so get so getting a master's in music, a master's is a very academic-y thing, mm. and in a sense, percussion. Is kind of academic-y, but it's kind of playing music. Yeah. So, so where do you feel like the the masters fits into your practice? So, yeah, at BU, I would definitely say um, definitely more on the conservatory side. Right. Like way more playing. I wrote like actually, I didn't even write a big paper. Oh really? My, you didn't... my big research class was I had to make an annotated bibliography. <laughs> okay. And well, so that's I was cool. Like, I mean, hey, I'll I'll learn how to do that. Sure. <laughs> no paper, you got me. Yeah. Uh, and and I think really it was because well, like the faculty were pushing for that because right. uh, my teacher Tim Jenis, who was in Sim- uh, Boston Symphony, he he was all about like look, I don't I don't care if you guys you know, write papers or do this, like, I want you to take auditions, you know, I mm, want you to do I see. what you're here right. to do. That makes sense. Um, you know, because everyone in that studio was, like, trying to be performers, you right. know, no one was there to, to write papers and, uh-huh. and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying about how, you know, music should feel, you know, or ha- where it belongs in the university, you feel like it's not necessary. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, you know, mainly I was going there for the lessons, Sure. but, uh, with the orchestra world, um, I feel like it's a little more necessary because just to get into auditions, there's right. sometimes things called resume rounds where oh, okay. they, they look at your resume and if you don't have a master's, they're definitely going to raise an eyebrow. Really? Yeah. Oh, I, mean, I didn't realize there was that. There's sort of like a gatekeeper it's, thing. It's, yeah, very much in the orchestra world. It's a, it's very heavy on that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, without a master's, you would have to have like a pretty good resume to get into some auditions, just oh. to have the opportunity to play for somebody. Wow. So yeah, that's that's definitely. I mean, I'm not saying it's good, but it's just kind of where we're at. Interesting. So. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The, that, that, the, the gatekeeping aspect of, of it is interesting, especially in the classical world. Yeah. Um, sort of coming from, uh, for me, I, I started in rock music, and then I went to school for classical composition, which mm. is like a little bit of a different world. Yeah. And then coming to L.A., 
where I started gigging, like where we met, like musical theater gigs. Yeah, yeah. Like they never ask anything like that. If you can do the job, no. can you do the job? Yeah. That's what they want to know. Yeah. So the there's this weird elitism in the universities and in and in the classical world that uh, I guess makes sense. Do you feel like that that gets into your into your head or into your practice at all? Like the the artistry and the artifice of classical music versus popular music. Because we were also talking about before when we were before the podcast, we were talking about like a band that you are playing in and playing yeah, around. Yeah. So where where do those where do those sides of your practice meet? Oh man. Um, so you're saying like the well the the first thing you were saying like does that get into my head the the sort of like well the, that you're things. able you're able to navigate both so yeah. like um sort of like the the shamanistic idea where <laughs> you can like interact this. at all strata of society yeah right because you aren't really in a class but but classical musicians quote uh-huh. obviously this isn't all classical musicians yeah but the the classical world of the university i know many composers like this who basically don't pay any attention to other forms of music and they see it as sort of the best kind of music. And then yeah. other forms of music have this too. Jazz has this. Yeah, yeah. Like these these sort of purity tests and this sort of like ivory tower built up around mm-hmm. a form of music. Yeah. And then being able to navigate within that and then also around it. Yeah. Okay, so I guess... Yeah, uh, so towing both sides of the line. Right. Um, yeah, uh, it, it can be frustrating, uh-huh. you know, because, um, you know, I, I've tried to just get into any type of music that I could get into. You sure. Know, just to make, um, you know, from pretty much like from when I started my undergrad, I kind of had this idea of like, I should be able to like fit into yeah. any kind of gig. Uh-huh. Because that's gonna, you know, it's making me, um, you know, uh, valuable. Absolutely. You know, if I could just jump from one thing to another, it gives me the most opportunities to work. And um, yeah, and then you run into something like classical music, where, um, you know, and even my teachers have told me this. It's like, y- y- you know, if you're not really like ninety, hundred percent into this, they're not, you know, they're gonna recognize that. Because, oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, it, just in the playing, you know, there's it's very like research based. Like before you got here, mm-hmm. I was, um, you know, going through all these excerpts, which are like little bits of music that yeah. you have to play in an audition for an orchestra. I was going through all these excerpts, and I was just like writing in tempos and nice. like character and all this stuff that you have to like yep. really have, you know, for each excerpt. And, um, yeah, so it's very research-based. It is like, I'm listening to recordings, uh-huh. and I'm like, oh, that's the tempo. But then my teacher's like, oh, well, did you look at the score? And then the score might have a different tempo. Oh, and wow. You have to yep. like, Interesting. It's, it's, so yep. it's really, yeah, that stuff is really, like, really heavy on the research and, you know, very much like, you know, if you're not in it, you're, uh-huh. you're not going to stay in it and this kind of thing. And, yeah, it, it can be pretty frustrating. And, and, like, currently I'm trying to toe the line because I'm trying to do that. But right. I like, I love playing drum set and I'm always looking for other opportunities and, uh-huh. you know, doing musicals whenever they come and, and <laughs> yeah. jazz hits. But, uh, yeah, it's, I would say that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still frustratingly trying to p- keep pushing it's in the great. orchestra direction. I, I love it. So yeah. is that, that's your passion then the, the orchestral orchestral <laughs> playing specifically or classical chamber or sort of all that? Well, role? so really I mean, I know like a lot of LA musicians are, you know, always trying to break into studio recording. Sure. And, yeah. you know, on the orchestral percussion side of that, that's like recording for movies oh, yeah. and TV. And that's that's huge. Like, yep. that's such a big deal. And, I, uh, you know, I know the guys that are doing it. And um, those players usually will have strong orchestral chops. Right. So it's like right. you're playing mallets or you're playing tambourine triangle or you're playing snare drum and it's like every instrument has to be perfect. Yep. And so, you know, that's that's kind of why I'm still like gunning at all this orchestra stuff mm-hmm. because I feel that it's preparing me to if I was ever asked to do a studio call, I, see. I would yeah, be yeah, yeah. more than ready for it. And yeah, so that's why I'm, you know, I'm still pushing on it. I feel like uh, 
Um, lately, I've been talking a lot about uh, the icky guy thing. Okay. Have you, have you talked about that? I don't know. Wait, what? No, no. The icky guy. Yeah, I'm sure you know. What? Uh, what? So it's <laughs> it's it's this uh, Japanese. I think it's a Japanese concept. Okay. And it's like it's like a because it's almost like the gig triangle. It's slightly different. Okay. So this is like a diamond, right? Yeah. And so um, the four sides of it. One is um, what you're good at. Uh huh. Okay. The next side is. Uh, what you like doing, uh -huh. like what you enjoy doing. Um, the third side is money. Uh -huh. You need money to live. And then the fourth side, and to me, this is like the most important, is is does society need this? Do people, oh, like, does this help? Okay, I see. The world? Yeah, yeah. And so that was tricky. Like, yeah, it's, it, music, we're, we're entertainment. It is tricky, you yeah, know? yeah. Sometimes it's it's very artful and uh -huh. it tones the line. But um, yeah, so looking at those four things, and, and I look, it's like, okay... You know, uh, am I good at this thing? And uh -huh. I feel like I'm, I'm, I've am i spent so much time on yeah. the orchestra chops that I feel like I'm really good at it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the second thing is, do I enjoy doing it? And uh -huh. I'd say for the most part, yeah. You nice. know, there's there's concerts, obviously, where I'm, I'm playing two bars and I'm just yeah. sitting down for most of the time. But, I, you know, I kind of accepted that when I started playing. <laughs> and sure. then, uh, yeah, and then third, money. It's, you know, with the... The level I'm at now, it's it's usually pretty good to very nice. Uh -huh. And then, uh, does it help society? I, I think there's concerts that are really great. Okay. Yeah. You know, sometimes the programming is right, uh -huh. and um, you know, and sometimes the pieces are really, really evocative, really make you think, or uh -huh. things like that, and make you feel good. Sure. Um, like for instance, uh, when I was playing with Santa Barbara last, we did um, this piece that a lot of orchestras have been doing uh, called Denzo Number no. Two. Oh, I did that in high school. No, oh yeah, <laughs> I was cool. on bassoon. Yeah, cool. Oh man, bassoon. Wow, I had no yeah. idea. Um, so, so yeah, we're playing Denzo Number no. Two, and um, you know, it was just so exciting. You know, yeah. we had like the full percussion section and, and I was playing timbales. Yeah. So we had like, it was oh, just crazy like, that it's taken off. I remember like it was, I noticed a bunch of orchestras doing it. Yeah. That's cool. Well, it's because, uh, so Dudamel, who's the conductor of the right. LA Phil, oh, before right. he was here, he was in Venezuela doing the La, yep. uh, El Sistema. Yep. And um, that was like the big piece. Like they did Marvel oh, from West Side Story. That's but probably they, why our, uh, our, our, our uh, band director had us do that. Yeah. Probably that's when it was like getting big from yeah. Dudamel. I it bet. got huge because yeah. they had this massive orchestra of kids and yeah. they sounded amazing. And and, right. and yeah, so playing So you did it with like Santa that. Barbara recently. Yeah, nice. yeah. And it's just such a lively piece. And I feel like, you know, if I was out in the audience, I'd be having a good time. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> that, that's awesome. Yeah. So so you're feeling so you you feel like that that's fulfilling a little bit that fourth that yeah fourth, that fourth point about does it help society yeah I think for you know I'm sure every musician was like thinking about that over pandemic and you right. know it's right. it's it's a deep dive that yeah. I feel like every musician goes through at some point and um, yeah you know I I try not to think about it too hard because sure you know obviously I could be a doctor you know directly saving people's lives but. Right, you know, that's that's a whole. I'm sure you've done podcasts but on that. <laughs> it's also interesting to think, especially in something like an orchestra, a structure mm -hmm. like that. So you're you're a percussionist. You're playing mallets, or you're playing bassoon, or you're playing whatever. Yeah. You're a piece, just like the same way that uh, a contractor building a tower. Like somebody's going to go through yeah. and do rivets, and somebody's going to do floors and whatever. Yeah. And it is is are they helping society in a big way? I mean, they're doing their piece of a larger thing. That's yeah. a part of society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, the contractor is like, yeah, you're just one guy, you know, cutting certain lengths of wood or something. Right. But, yeah, when you look or at the Or you're playing thing, minor scale. Or you're playing minor <laughs> scales. And, 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 yeah, that goes back to practice. It's like, okay, why am I, you know, practicing these excerpts, these little five-second clips of music um, so I can perform better so that the music is, you know that much more clear to the listener, I guess. Because, mm -hmm. you know, bad players, the music isn't as clear. It's, you know, people aren't going to have a good time. Right. The other thing, staying on the Dan Zon bit about the audience having a good time, I see a big problem in orchestra performances where people are going sort of because it's fancy to go to the orchestra, mm -hmm. but people don't enjoy it or don't know how to listen. And I actually had this experience... When I was a teenager, when I was thinking about going to music school, 
and I would listen to uh, classical music, and it was it, it was like it sounds nice for a couple seconds, and it would get really boring really fast because sure. I had no idea what I was listening to. Yeah, and so where do you see the orchestra fitting? Because like Danzon's great because it's so people can kind of latch onto it because it's got yeah. these themes and it's and it, it's got these rhythms that are really exciting. Yeah, but yeah. some something like. Uh, like a Haydn symphony. If mm-hmm. you don't know what you're listening to, it's like, oh, that sounds pretty. And like 30 seconds in, like, okay, now I want something else. Yeah, yeah. So where do you see the function of the orchestra in society, sort of staying on the society point? Yeah. Um, so uh, some things that orchestras have been doing, uh, I think, are really great. Yeah. Um, so one of those things is um, for, for pieces like that, like the Haydn symphony, uh, a lot of orchestras have been doing like a sort of talk uh, before the concert. They'll do like mm, a yes, concert yeah, talk. Yeah, yep, yep. And um, they'll kind of, uh, it's been great at Long Beach, uh, they usually have our conductor do it. Yeah. And so it, it's great because he's just like, oh, in this first movement, you know, he he writes this because this is what was happening in the uh-huh. composer's life or this is what he had in mind. And, you know, sometimes it's just conjecture, but even so, it's like, oh, okay, it gives the audience something to picture. Right. And I was just talking with uh, one of my friends how, um, you know, when I was in high school, that would help out so much when you know, we were playing some piece and, uh, you know, the, the, the band director would explain, like, some mm-hmm. of the feelings, some of the thoughts that right, right. Um, are happening in a chunk of music. And all of a sudden, I just, I could play it better. Yes. And it was more enjoyable. Uh-huh. I was more connected to it. Because it wasn't just sounds like high and low, right? You know, uh-huh. it had like some sort of story that was right. trying, like a narrative. The, the development of form, at least. In your yeah, mind, right? yeah. So I, th- I think the the pre concert talk is really like a great way to to help bring the audience in. Sure. Um, another thing that I've I've loved doing, and I wish I could see more of, is that. Um, a lot of orchestras are doing um, playing playing the soundtrack to a movie. Oh yes, that's right. fun. Yep, yep. Yeah, yep. I mean it's it's almost like an opera yes. in a way, but uh, just so fun. And uh, I did one with Star Trek, one of the newer Star oh, Treks, cool. and um, doing those kinds of things, and doing video game concerts. Like there's there's a whole touring. Circuit. I don't know about this. Oh, it's it's great. So there's uh, I think you know there's probably a few orchestras. And it's not like not like oh Huntsville Symphony or, or L.A. Phil right, like right. it's just like an orchestra of players that are touring around okay. playing these video game concerts and just music of Zelda music of Mario oh just, but they're not like playing live to a video yeah, game yeah I mean sometimes I mean that would be wild yeah, you have to get the jump oh, I know. <laughs> But uh, no, and, and and sometimes in these concerts they'll they'll show like clips of the video game yeah, going yeah. on. But yeah, playing the music from video games, you know, I'm someone who grew up with video games like pretty strong in my yeah. life as a kid, yeah. and and I know that's only going to continue. Uh-huh. And I I feel like that's such a great investment because you know I've never seen any of those concerts not sell out. They're just huge. Yeah, you know, it's such a it's such a massive fan base and and. You know, people who were young and wanting to go out as compared to, you know, most like what we think of stereotypes for orchestras. People yeah. going to see Beethoven are, are not like the young cats. Yeah, now, so. right, right. Yeah. Yeah, there's a coolness thing there. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just, you know, the the people who grew up with some of these games are now like, you know, in their 30s or 40s, right. 50s and are, you so know. So they want to go out to a concert. Yeah, I mean, they have, they have money. They want to <laughs> do something new. Yep, yep. It's seeing an orchestra because it's like the sound is, is different. I mean, right. you hear it in headphones, that's cool. But when you go to the orchestra, you see what's making the sound. Yes, yep. And yep. as percussionists, like that's that's our bread and butter. Like we have like you know, cymbal crashes mm-hmm. and we have like these huge chimes and gongs and little like sound effect things and shooting a gun, you know, all that <laughs> stuff is, it's all, it's all part of the, part of the yeah. repertoire for us. So yeah, I think it's definitely a visual experience and, yep. and people love seeing that. So. And do you feel connected as a player to, to an audience in a situation like that? Oh yeah. I mean, cause uh, a lot of the times it's like, oh yeah, I love this game. Right. <laughs> you well, know? Because, like, if you're playing a funk gig or a jazz gig yeah. or something, well, jazz, the audiences can be into it. Or not. It depends. But if you're, play, if you're playing, like, a funk gig or, like, the modern, like, pop soul gigs and stuff mm-hmm. like that, 
and you're connected with the audience, yeah. that feeling is wild. Yeah. And it's so cool. Yeah. Versus an orchestra, you're usually A so far away from the audience. And the audience is sitting and they're very politely listening. Yeah. And so the whether or not they're they might be very into it, but mm. feeling that that connectedness, I I imagine is much harder. But in an yeah. orchestra you have all the other musicians on stage. Yeah. And so like this it's this this much wider mediation versus you're on stage playing drums or playing guitar and everybody's rocking out right in front yeah. of you versus you're playing drums and maybe you're rocking out sort of or you're connected to this music and there's a conductor in the middle that's sort of mediating this relationship happening between mm. you and the and, the, and audience. the audience and so how how does that the the connectedness differ for you because for me, that's like the most important thing with music is being connected to the other players and the other and the people listening. Yeah, like it, it's a connection. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So how how does that feel in the orchestra setting? Where does that that connectedness to the listeners exist for you? Yeah. So so um, the nice thing is, like like you said, like uh, when an orchestra concert, you're with a bunch of other players on right. stage. So there's at least that connection. Yes, like you're absolutely. very connected to the conductor, hopefully. Yep. And uh, and you're also very connected to the players around you. And, and it's percussion. I usually have a couple others. But for instance, uh, this last Long Beach concert, um, there was one piece, this piano concerto, and it was just me, mm -hmm. percussion, and then the rest of the orchestra. And um, yeah, so that kind of... That kind of compensates because I, I have played, you know, these with these funk bands, and yeah, it's like a very like you you're looking at these I mean, that people feeling and is dancing, wild. yeah, and it's it's great, right? Um, and with an orchestra, yeah, I mean, I, it's, I sometimes I can't even see yep. most mm -hmm. of the people out there, so it's all about me connecting with the conductor and connecting with the other uh -huh. players on stage, and so I would say it, it does feel like a little more stressful, I guess. Yes, you know, because yep. I'm yeah, I'm connecting with my boss kind of, <laughs> <laughs> and these these friends who are like also hoping and kind of relying on me, you yep. know, like yep. we do in a band. Um, but uh, so um, you know, while that's all going, the connection with the audience it's it's almost like a very intense delayed gratification. Yes, because you you can think like, oh wow, I hope they heard that. I hope they enjoyed yep. like this part of the music, mm -hmm. and and now we're waiting for the next movement, and mm -hmm. then you know, and then you finish, and then that's when you're Woo! sort of really connect and <laughs> yes. you stand up, and and I I guess that's like the moment. <laughs> when I feel like I'm most connected is, is when they like have a stand yes. and like, Oh, here's the orchestra. And, and I'm standing there and I'm like, okay, I hope they like enjoyed it. And you know, if they really enjoyed my drumming, maybe they're looking at me, but yeah, but that's it. It's a very more reserved kind of, it thing. really is. Yeah. 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 That's so it, it's, it's tough, but you know, there's people out there that are just still, you know, even to this day, like so nuts about classical music yeah, you know, I actually had a, a drum set student um, who was, you know, I was he was at first doing classical percussion, and uh, he was also wanted to be a composer, and so oh, great. Um, he was asking about composers and stuff, and I was like, here's these romantic guys, mm -hmm. here's the classical guys, and I I was like starting to get him into more contemporary uh -huh. stuff like movie composers and mm -hmm. stuff. He was like. No, I, I like Brahms. I nice. Like, That's okay, great. Okay, cool. Right on. You know, yeah. but... Uh, so what yeah. do you play for Brahms on percussion? Um, well, that's that's more like timpani. Um, okay. You know, uh, yeah, timpani is kind of like a very constant thing in I orchestra. See. It's actually... Oh, like orchestral. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of its own position, actually. You have the timpanist is yeah. like their own spot. It's actually usually like one of the highest paid jobs I see. in the orchestra. And then the percussion section is everything else. Yes. Yeah, and, and we, you know, it's, yeah, it's, there's there's a whole, like, timpani. Right. Well, it's its own staff on the, it's yeah. on the, uh, you know, on the they score, got, too. You got their own staff. Um, it, it's not like <laughs> percussion, go to timpani. Yeah, yeah, no, don't don't tell them that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny, man. But, um, yeah, so with the Brahms, Ooh. the other percussion would be, like, cymbals, bass right. drum, you know. No, so what yeah. I was thinking is, like, um... I wasn't thinking in an orchestral context. That makes perfect sense. I was I was imagining like, are there like marimba arrangements of Brahms sonatas? Oh yeah, well that. I, mean, I bet there are, but yeah, yeah. I mean, when it comes to that stuff, um, a lot of these instruments are still fairly new compared right. to instruments like violin or piano. Right. Um, so you're talking about marimba. 
Um, that's for those of you who don't know, marimba is just like a big xylophone. Um, it just has a, a much lower range. Mm -hmm. The xylophone is like you know pretty pretty high. I think it's like the lowest note is like a C. Mm -hmm. Five or six. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not that good with those. Um, but a marimba, yeah, it, it goes into the bass clef. And it's kind of our solo instrument, right? You know, a lot of a lot of players can do all these solos on on melodic instruments. We are not uh, as fulfilled in that repertoire, but we're getting there. Oh yeah. And so, what a lot of people do on marimba is still like a good core of it is playing Bach. Yes. Yep. You know? I've heard tons so, of that. So yep. we play a ton of that, and and so almost all the solo rep that we play uh, are arrangements for other instruments. Right. So well, tons of baroque. I've heard tons of baroque stuff. Mm -hmm. Actually, what I yeah. haven't really heard is really a whole lot of romantic yeah. writing yeah. arranged for percussion. Huh? You know, you know? Yeah. I mean, people are starting to dig into some of that. Like Chopin um, for yeah. I mean, that actually would probably well, sound pretty good on a xylophone. Yeah, there's a, a Chopin, um, a, one of the marzukas uh -huh. that um, has been pretty popular to play in marimba. Okay, uh, yeah. It's a dum bum bum. Bum, 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 nice. Bum, bum, bum. Uh, so that, yeah, and they're they're starting to dig in, and I I had some friends arrange um, a movement from Tchaikovsky's Symphony Four. Oh, the cool. The third movement. It's great because the third movement's all pizzicato strings, yep. so it's all these short sounds, and it works great. <laughs> that's the marimbas. Yep, yep. That's all it is. Um, so yeah, th th you know, there people are widening their view, but there's also tons of new works that are coming out uh -huh. a lot now. So. So where do you see the role of percussion in music? Ah, oh, man. Well, I think it still plays a huge part um, in, you know, movie scoring and, and TV uh -huh. scoring. Um, percussion as a whole, like if you're including like drum set and yeah. hand drums, like it's, I feel like it's invaluable um, with a lot of music these days. Um, just because, uh, I don't know, there's there's something very lively and very primal about this family of instruments Absolutely. and i feel like people have really you know since uh i don't know i mean it just feels like it's been constant but especially with all the electronic music mm -hmm. that's come i feel like having live drums or even synthesized drums it's just um it's it's so valuable to these you know sort of new music composers that mm -hmm. are any anything in the pop genre you have to have some kind of cool beat, right? Of course. And yeah, yeah. and yeah, I mean, you think of any of like the big popular genres right now, there's usually some kind of heavy beat in the back and, uh -huh. and it's usually live drums. I mean, there's, there's plenty of synthesized stuff out there, but mm -hmm. if you go to see a live show of these artists, they have a real drummer. Right. That's, that's what blew me away when I saw Snoop Dogg. Um, cause I never thought of like, Oh yeah, you need a drummer for Snoop. Oh, he plays with a live drummer. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's so much fun. It's not just the hitting play. Yeah. Yeah. That's I know. Cool. It's like probably a just... little hitting play. But... Yeah. I mean, you have like a DJ <laughs> in the back there, but yeah. no, but he, he had an actual band and stuff okay. come out and, yeah, I think a lot of people have been have been hyping that because it, it, again, it's like a visual thing. You connect and you just like, oh, I know there's like a big beat stop and then it comes back in and you're yep. looking for it and it's like, oh, oh, there it is. Nice, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, my my composition teacher in undergrad used to tell this story about the orchestra. This was an orchestration class and how to think about it. Mm -hmm. And he would always say the orchestra is the string quartet. That's it. Period. End of story. That oh, the orchestra's about the violin, whatever. So all this other yeah. stuff is fluff. And he said those were the those were the high class people in town, and then the the path, the, the the shepherds from the field with their horns came down, mm. and they wanted to get in on it. Yeah. And then the, the 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 snare drum player and the flute player from the armory across the yeah. street, they wanted to get in on it. And he said to to actually think about these families of instruments like that. And so there's this artifice and this this elitism in the strings that's there. Yeah. And then <laughs> and then the horn players, those are like farmers. Yeah. And then your trumpet players and your flute players and your drummers, those are like militaristic people. And to like think of those, those are your timekeepers and those are your like precision instruments. Yeah. And then if you think about drums, like this might offend you, it might not, but like the idea that dr drums and are first and foremost timekeepers. Yeah. And then I think of bass and guitar as just pitched versions of those. So your drum set has boom chick, boom chick yeah. as like its 
the the very basic. That's what it is. Yeah. Boom chick, low high, yeah, heavy light or yeah. something like that. Yeah. And then your bass is just giving pitch to the boom. Yeah. And your guitar is giving pitch to the chick. Yeah. And so it's expanding rhythm into harmony. And so like that's your rhythm section, a guitar or piano or whatever, something yeah. with chords. But it's like it's it's rhythm, it's timekeeping, right? I mean drums is rhythm and all that. Yeah. And so like at its root, it's a timekeeping instrument hmm. versus violin, which at its root is a singing instrument. Yeah. Yeah, a melodic instrument. Or like singing and dancing. Yeah. So a drummer is dancing. Yeah. And a okay. violin is singing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, there's so much of like, you know, uh, so I, I teach elementary school right. kids. And so we start with all these like basic concepts and, and talking about like harmony and, and melody. It's right. like, you know, there's always something supporting uh -huh. the, the thing that's in your ear. Yep. You know, whether it's whether it's a beat or uh -huh. whether it's just a, a harmony like the Oh, what, was, what was that called? Uh, uh, basso Continuo. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, right, yeah right. back in the day. Um, and so, yeah, there's always just something supporting that voice. And we were talking about bass and guitar. Yeah, I mean, that's the rhythm section, you know, just more like proving my case that rhythm is like so, yep. so crucial to so mm -hmm. many types of music. And um, yeah, and, and so that way, yeah, I guess you, with something like that, you know, you could get away without having the drums because you already have that right. sort of the bass holding down the sort of the big notes, right? And then the guitar adding the syncopation. Yeah. But I don't think you don't need it. I think actually yeah. the drums probably more important than the bass. It's like it's this mediation. It's like the power of a rhythm section. Yeah, is the drum is the basis of it. Yeah, and then the the bass and and the guitar, or the piano, or whatever your chordal instrument is. Mm. is then expanding that into the harmonic world yeah it's, it's funny and and you know i i'll, I'll take it i'll take it <laughs> drums are needed you need more um but uh it's funny i've always thought of drums as, as well specifically looking at drum set but also kind of orchestra percussion too i always thought it was just coloring like these other sounds. Color. That's interesting. Well, yeah. so this is this is a little bit like what my my composition teacher was saying is that like all this stuff is extra. That it's, oh, yeah. it's the, really the it's the, violin, string the string quartet. Is that's the it. Only you don't even need basses. Yeah. That's extra. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just cello. And the basses cello. are always just doubling the cello part anyway. Yeah, yeah. a lot of the time. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Well. So yeah. I mean, like like your teacher was saying. Yeah. You. The string, <laughs> the string quartet is. The, what we were talking about, the harmony and the melody. Like, yep. That's what a song is, or yep. like a lot of songs are. Uh, and so, yeah, like you were saying, like all these other instruments just kind of found their way into the orchestra. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I try to approach drum set like that too, just because, um, you know, uh, hopefully all the players that I'm playing with have good time and they, keep, they can keep time by themselves. Yeah. Like they don't need me to like click a metronome in their face. Um, and so when I approach stuff like that, I'm always thinking about like, whose sound am I coloring? Yeah. You know, if I'm playing a beat, like, yeah, maybe my, my right foot is, is helping color the bass. Right. Right. And then my left hand playing the snare drum is, is helping color the horns. Like maybe they have stabs on two and sure, four or something sure. like that. And, and yeah, the, you know, piano's playing eighth notes, my right hand's playing eighth notes. That's interesting. So you see it actually. You're an accompanist. Yeah. You're accompanying the bass and the piano and the horns. Yeah. That's fascinating. A lot of, a lot of time. I mean, I guess it depends on the music. So right. like going into jazz, that's that's what I'm thinking most right. of the time. Like I'm playing jazz. Like I'm, you know, I I like to think that me and the bass player are sharing the responsibility of the time. Right. Uh -huh. But I feel like I also I'm controlling the energy, like yes, the volume, of course, and and the color, because you know, if, if I change to a different ride symbol, that's that's a different color. It's usually yeah. going to be like a smaller sound or a bigger sound or whatever it's going to be. But it's it's you know, it's coloring whoever's playing, um, and it's just kind of creating like a vibe as, as we, we talk about a lot today, but, um, yeah. And then when I, when I go to more, just the drummer playing a beat in a musical, mm -hmm. maybe it's not as much color. Maybe it is more of a timekeeper because I've played plenty of gigs where things were a little squirrely and oh, yeah. I just simplify way down. Oh yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, I didn't need to do that in Legally Blonde cause we were with a click 
and I was playing with great players, yes. so I wasn't worried about that. But I've definitely played plenty of musicals where it's no click and we're spread out and like, you know, this you just set up to fail. Just yeah, yeah. So it it can be pretty scary. And that's when I'm not thinking about color. I'm thinking like my job is to just keep these guys together. <laughs> you know, so yep, it's yep. yeah, it's a trade off, but um, I feel like in the best situations, um, I'm usually like providing extra color to things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Color, it's, color's an interesting idea. The reason I said accompanist is when I think color, I think harmony, mm -hmm. right? And then yeah. you're talking about timbre, right? A different ride symbol, something yeah. like that. Yeah. That in a sense is harmony. Like the yeah. spectral composers, like yeah. they said that timbre oh, is harmony, oh, right? Because oh, they build their yeah. harmony off the harmonic spectrum of, of a sound, like yeah, a symbol. A symbol will have different harmonics. Exactly, exactly. And yeah, that's nuts. Like the idea of color like chord substitutions changes the color and all that. Yeah. So that's that's what I that's what I really like is I like being in that space too. I like being an accompanist. I actually yeah. don't love being a soloist. Yeah. I'll I'll do it. I'm happy to do it, but yeah. like I love existing in the texture and in the color yeah. of something. Yeah. And and it's like that is all the orchestra is to me. It's like you're all you're constantly just part of the sound. Yeah. And you know, of course, there are soloists, and then you have your moment, but um, like 90, 95% of it is just all like fitting into that texture. Yeah. Even though, like, all the instruments I play in the orchestra are solo instruments, like, right. there's never like two xylophones. I mean, very seldom, like, there's never like two tambourines yep. or two yep. things. So it's, it's, you know, I always, I've, it's kind of, I am playing a solo, but I'm trying to make it fit within the texture. Yeah. And, and just harmonize with yeah. everybody else. There we go. Harmonize. Yeah, I love let's it. Let's do it. You're harmonizing harmonize. with a snare drum, man. Yeah. That's hey, great. Anytime. <laughs> yeah. uh, so have you gotten into like chamber music with percussion a whole lot? Um, yeah. I mean, percussion it, ensembles. It happens like a lot more in college. You sure. Know, of course. Of course. Um, like you can count on a, a couple of hands how many professional groups, like professional yep. percussion ensembles. It's, it's tough to do because. You know, with all, all the instruments you need to make it happen yep. and, and moving those instruments, it's a you need logistics. 16 bands. Yeah, logistics are nuts for that kind of thing. Um, I have had opportunities to play it. The last one I did was actually on Easter. Oh, I was. This was unexpected, but a, a friend hit me up, uh, and he works at a church in Glendale, and I guess he's been, been doing this for a while. He does this just big sort of Easter concert with a percussion ensemble uh -huh. and choir. And it's really cool because, yeah. you know, I've, I've done that mix of, of, you know, instruments a few times now, percussion ensemble and choir, because, you know, choir is so, like, you think of, like, really yep. long notes a lot mm -hmm. of the time, percussion is the opposite, and it's such a good yeah. balance. Um, so, yeah, the, playing the chamber stuff is really fun, and, uh, yeah, like I said, it's not as many opportunities, but... Any chance I get, I, I take it because it's usually yeah. like pretty demanding stuff. I mean, the rep is so cool, especially contemporary stuff like John Luther Adams stuff. You yeah, get into that. yeah, like the, I've seen some of that. Like the, the the field drums and the snare, and yeah. they're just like dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it for yeah. like ten minutes, and it's yeah. like, whoa, this it's, world is so weird. Yeah, no, it, it's really cool. And actually, um, LA Phil is doing a concert on Wednesday. It's, uh, it's like they have their new music series, like Green Umbrella. Oh yes, yes, that's right. So they're doing a concert on Wednesday. I'm trying to go to and percussion there's like a percussion ensemble piece on in and nice um yeah so unfortunately it's mostly just in the academic world um but yeah you know the work that comes is like i said is very challenging and you know and um yeah i feel like uh i'm always trying to to take that kind of work because I, I feel it helps my my orchestra side mm -hmm. as well and you know all of that working towards you know possibly working in a studio yes yeah. You also just have to mesh with all these other players. And well, I mean, all that contemporary stuff comes out of the tradition. Like Beethoven goes all the way to John Luther Adams, kind yeah. of a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, what about the other side of it? Your your drum set playing the quote vernacular music. Yeah, <laughs> to yeah. be elitist about it. Yeah, I mean, the, my other chamber music. I yeah. guess uh, right. Nice. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I, I mean, uh, I'm just it's a mixed consort. You yeah. know, my the rock band I play with, uh, yeah. but. Uh, yeah, um, you know, that stuff, um, yeah, it's funny. I don't, like, think of, like, oh, I'm going to a chamber music rehearsal tonight, but it really <laughs> is. Like, you just have to balance yeah. with, like, a very small group yep. and, 
and you know you kind of have to be aware of everybody's parts mm -hmm. you know because uh yeah people can you know put in new things and right. if you're not paying attention it'll throw you but uh yeah you know for that kind of stuff oh i, I play with this uh this group uh ronnie marsalis uh philadelphia big brass it's a very okay. long name but uh what, what is it the, uh ronnie marsalis philadelphia, philadelphia big brass okay big big brass <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, he's actually Winton's cousin, so he's oh, very much whoa. the same the same vibe. So he does like classical music uh -huh. and jazz, okay. and, and mixing in the the New Orleans style, and uh, yeah. So that's that's a great chamber group that uh -huh. I play with, and um, yeah, those those rehearsals are like really intense. You know, we just we fly into a place and then. You know, we have like a two, you know, two hour rehearsals. Whoa. And then, you know, we'll play like the next two or three days and just, Great. you know, play, fly, play, fly. That's that awesome. Thing. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it puts high demand, you know, in a rehearsal. I want to just show up and be able, be as flexible yeah. as I mm -hmm. can. So, you know, that just comes from practicing my instrument mm -hmm. and, you know, being able to just change something and, mm -hmm. um, uh, a, a great example of this, I was actually playing with this other chamber group that's out in Santa Monica. Uh, they're called Jacaranda. Okay. It's very contemporary chamber music. And uh, it was a 9-11 concert, and we were playing this um, this piece. Uh, I can't remember the composer. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, um, it was like drum set, bass, piano. Like, so that was like right. kind of the rhythm section. And then there were strings. And then chorus, and you know everyone's part was challenging, but yeah. the, the chorus especially, they're like singing like minor seconds, ooh, and, and ooh, like yeah. all stacked on it. Everyone had like their own part. Great. There's no like, oh, these guys are altos. No, it's like, you know, alto one two three Whoa. tenor. You know, it was nuts. Um, and, but you know, there was a spot where um, we're playing, we're playing in five eight. The chorus is doing uh -huh. crazy stuff. Can't listen to them. The strings are in their own thing. Yeah. And we're playing in 5-8, and there's a grouping of six happening over this. And then there will be like 5-8, 5-8, 5-8, 6-8. 5-8, 6-8. But there, like I said, there's those groupings also in there going. Right. And so the bass player who's saying like, man, yeah, it's like, uh, these, wow, like I don't feel like our parts line up. And it's like, is there anything you could do? To like you know help accent any of these beats and i was like oh well like you know i'm playing this beat on top but maybe i can like try to like put put your down beats on my, with my kick drum uh -huh. and so like on the spot i'm like kind of <laughs> put, putting in new accents yeah. on my kick drum part and just yeah. i like you know with drum set stuff we tend to just kind of compose like yeah. you look at your part and that's kind of a guide Right, um, right. Well, there isn't the history of like play each note yeah. exactly as written. Yeah. And probably most people aren't writing it to be played exactly as written. Yeah, either. yeah. It's, you know, uh, typically writing for drum set, and this goes out to any composers out there, it's uh, hard. a lot of times less is more. You know, yeah. if, you, if you write less, usually the drummer will, yep. will fill in the rest. And it's usually what you want. Yeah. You know, uh, and if not, you just tell them, tell them a little different. But trying to write out every note can just you know, make someone really frustrated yep. or yep. just, you know, cloud it, gets too busy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, and so here I am and I'm just like changing this part on the fly in the rehearsal. Um, but fortunately, I had been practicing stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know, playing a beat and then oh, you know, okay, accenting cool. something that's not in that beat. Yep. And um, yeah, so it was that preparation that allowed me to be a good chamber player. Great, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, it's, it's about listening, but it's also about... Being flexible with the mm -hmm. other players, we need to change something. Change something. Yeah, so. I mean that's part of the practice of of being a being a, a musician is being able to have that flexibility. Yeah. I mean it's this problem is some people are so tied to exactly what's on the page, yeah, and they're not. I feel like they're not taking the lessons from what is on the page. Yeah, because the page is like these are things that in theory you could be able to do at any time if mm. you've learned them, and I feel like percussionists really embrace that i mean like the way you hear percussionists practicing in the practice room in music school yeah is like they're learning skills as well as learning rap yeah but yeah like transferable skills like i remember i was talking do you know lon hayes the drummer percussionist uh, no. does a lot of musical theater stuff but uh he uh he was telling me about this thing he does to practice 
where he said that everything is based on a five again or, or by a three against two rhythm. That's okay, your yeah. That's the bass rhythm you should have in your heart all the time. <laughs> yeah, sure. And like every rhythm can be derived from that. And so what he would do is he'd do like two in his kick and three in the hat, like boom, mm. boom, yeah. kind of a thing. And then he'd like go up the evens and odd subdivisions because he's mm. like then four is just double the two and yeah. six is double the three and eight is quadruple the two and mm. and you can just do it that way and you can just go up like that yeah and then the like the weird ones the fives and sevens fit in between yeah yeah the prime numbers exactly and then you but you still keep the boom chicka, boom boom chicka, boom yeah boom, chicka, boom like you keep it the whole time yeah it's funny you mention that that's all this tattoo oh is. really yeah what, so, is, what is it uh, so for those listening brian has here, a tattoo just, on his forearm yeah. yeah 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 somewhere close to the camera uh, everyone yeah that. there's a few colors there's actually blue red and yellow the yellow okay. is like pretty faded but so all the red is um these are all duples okay so two so two would be dividing the circle in two uh -huh. and then four nice and then eight cool right and then blue would be dividing it into three or six, uh -huh. and then there's a really faded yellow, but that was five. And I oh, just, like, I see. Mathematic, yep. math, mathed it out. But um, yeah, so it's and uh, then the the top is where they're tied the together, where they meet, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. And, and so I I thought I was a genius when I came up with this. I was like, uh, it was like the year before I was going to grad school, and I was I like got the idea from a clock. Yeah. You know, because it's like, oh, you have like the big subdivision, yep. of like 12 and 6. And and then I was like, oh, that's great. You do like notes like this. And I thought I was like the original genius. And <laughs> and I. And Clocks, I, man, circles. It's yeah. So cycles, I know. Right? And, and it's funny. I always like when I meet musicians and they ask me about them, I always let them guess. And like, I got all these guesses. And very few people, I think I could count like five people yeah. who've gotten it. Nice. But um, I was at how like, many are drummers or percussionists? Uh, only like two, like of the actually, ones who've gotten. Yeah, it. Ah. yeah. Um, but it's funny. I was I was at like a Dairy Queen or a Subway, and this, <laughs> and this I'm I'm getting my stuff. He's like, "Oh, cool tattoo." I was like, "Yeah, thanks." And he was like, "Is that like the African Rhythm Circle?" And I was like, "What? <laughs> the what?" <laughs> And sure enough, I look it up, and, and they already did it. The, oh, is that what that it's is? It's a concept. I and, see. Um, like, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, so they 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 teach rhythm as like a circle. So it's yep. like the top is the downbeat, and it's like you could teach any rhythm just by feeling that, and you always point the downbeat like bum, 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 bum. Right, right, right. Yep. That two or three or four or six. Yeah, I mean, that's how I practice scales, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah? I, 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 go, I go from... Uh, like one, it's, I don't do it in circles, uh -huh. but with a metronome, the same yeah, thing. Yeah. I, I do I do one per beat uh, up to cool. nine and then back. Oh, cool. And then cool. I go through the circle of fifths like that. But then, but I also think of harmony in terms of circles too. Hmm. And like whenever I'm writing a, a piece of music, like in the chamber or orchestral sense, I, I, I come up with like semi tonal systems based on cool. non traditional pitch collections, but it's always in cycles Crazy. based on like similar principles to a circle of fifths. Okay. Which you can also then take and derive, like you can do with rhythm too. Yeah. Because like rhythmic relations are harmonies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, and I think of it as like rhythmic modulations, like when you're, when you're going from like two, you know, ba, 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 yep. ba, 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 and that, that's the new that's quarter cool. note or things like yep. that. So is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, also what I'm talking about is like two against three literally is a, is a fifth. Yeah. So that it's is a, a harmony. <laughs> it's a what? Oh yeah, yeah, so two against three, like, um, yeah. If I sped this up, yeah, to like four hundred hertz, uh -huh. we would hear a fifth. Oh man, that that's, that's it's me literally away. a it's literally a harmony. <laughs> yeah, that's it's... what a harmony because the frequency of this against the frequency of this. Yeah, two to three. I can't. <laughs> yeah, once you can't get up to four. Right, but if, but if you did it on a computer, yeah, like you if you take two kick drums. Yeah. Like these low, you think it's low. Yeah. But you just speed it up enough and you hear a fifth. Jeez. Yeah, that, that stuff, I, I <laughs> like heard people talk about it, but it still kind of melts my brain when it's when like, it's, it's like the, the fractal nature of harmony and rhythm. Rhythm is harmony. Yeah. Wild. <laughs> yeah, they, you know. The, but the, yeah. but that's great, the, 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 the tattoo thing. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I know a lot of drummers who uh, like have a tattoo of like a rhythmic 
idea. Like, yeah. there's this drummer I know who's who wants to get a tattoo of like how subdivisions can allow you to move, and so like three four is also fifteen sixteen or something. Hmm. I, I don't remember how he does it. It's like it's a different way of feeling the subdivision that gets you from even to odd. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, okay. And so it, he has this like intersecting triangles of like you can get anywhere from anywhere. Cool. <laughs> cool. So you just like teleportation kind of stuff, or <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> yeah. Know. Move anywhere to yeah. anywhere. Yeah. Dang, that's yeah. heavy. Yeah, it's it's cool. I I I, I love rhythm so much. It's yeah. so cool. Mm. Yeah. So 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 what about the other side, the rock band you mentioned? Yeah. Mm. So so we talked about the band. Yes. And. So what 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 are they called? What kind of stuff? Is oh, uh, compared so, to all this all this hoity toity classical yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, man. Okay, so yeah, the the band I play with uh, is this group uh, Victor and the Vagabonds. Okay, and um, yeah, and we play rock. It's uh, you know sometimes uh, you know it's it's rock with a little bit of a, a country blues. Oh, nice kind of sound. Um, yeah, and we got a violinist. Uh, pianist and then rhythm uh-huh. section and the singers and and yeah we do harmonies and stuff but yeah like sometimes it sounds like Radiohead sometimes oh, cool. it sounds like you know the later Beatles stuff or Stones and mm-hmm. or Doors and um, yeah so just this you know a lot of the music that we like we just kind of end up sounding like it obviously but um, it's yeah it's it's a great balance to my life whereas i go right. to a long beach symphony rehearsal and it can be pretty stressful I and bet, you know yeah, yeah and did i forget anything did i forget my second cowbell oh my god you know <laughs> stress um and then i i go and i we just rehearse in victor's living room and great you know, and it's just such a and the beers are in the fridge yep. and it's just a very laid-back vibe and and it's nice you know it was a little work at the beginning you know memorizing the tunes but you know, now that I've played with him for so long, it's just, um, you know, I know most of the songs. So we mm-hmm. just kind of come in and tweak some stuff. Yeah. And, and then we're playing the next show and the next yeah. day or something. I mean, it's a big difference in classical practice or even, or even pit orchestras, anything yeah, like that. Yeah. Session work, you're reading. Yeah. So, like, you don't have to internalize it in the same way. Mm-hmm. Versus pop music, rock music, all that stuff. There it's isn't really a tradition of playing with music in front of you, and it's like a little bit lame if you Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a <laughs> stigma, yeah. So. But it's crazy. Like, it can be really complex, too. Like, a dream theater concert. Like, that's, they, <laughs> yeah. they know all that stuff. It's all, like, yeah. in their bodies. Or, yeah. like, um, when... Uh, uh, who's it? Dweezil Zappa. When mm. Zappa does Zappa, they're doing all these really oh, yeah. complex yeah. No music tunes. stands on their their stage, but they're, yeah. I, I saw Zappa play Zappa, and they had like Steve Vai and, yeah, and cool. Terry Bozio and, and all the guys. and Yeah, they're insane. But uh, yeah, that's almost chamber music to me. Just yes. it's the, like, the, yeah, it's so crazy what yeah. they could do. But um, yeah, but you're, you're right. This is, you know, very uh, much not like that. And it's all internalized and. Um, yeah, and uh, going back to talking about connecting with the audience, like uh-huh. when it's that internalized, like that's all you do. Like, yeah, I feel like the whole show, I'm just very much trying to connect with everyone. Great, and, yeah, but and there is that complexity though, because even even with this band, um, you know, there's songs that we do. Like, there's this, this ballad that was kind of made me like want to be in this band and want to uh-huh. do this thing. Uh, it's called Painted for You, and uh, it's mostly in 3-4, but there's just these really, like, you know, just spots here and there where it will be, like, a bar four, or, nice. like, this is, like, three, and then two, and so it's, like, oh, is that five, whatever. But, mm-hmm. yeah, there's just these moments where it's it's not, it doesn't put you out of the music, uh-huh. and at least that's our goal, and we want to just, like, keep it in that feel, yeah. but... Yeah, it, it is tricky to just kind of memorize all those things, and I just do it by the lyrics. And yes. it's funny because well, because they're songs, right? Yeah, songs are about lyrics. They're about yeah. singing. And that's so funny because like when I was growing up and listening to like Zeppelin yep. and and the Who and Queen and all these guys, I was I wasn't big on the lyrics. Interesting. You know, I was way more about like the the guitar and hearing like and just the sound of the voice. Like I wasn't hearing yeah. the words so uh-huh. much. I was hearing like the voice and I was like, oh man, this, I love singing that or something. I yeah. didn't know the words. It wasn't until I, I started listening to Jimi Hendrix and that's when um, like I actually like went into the album booklet and was yeah. looking at the lyrics. And I was like, oh wow, like this is like 
so you know artful yeah i mean i feel like there's a big difference for people who are using their voice as an instrument like if i think of of uh of robert plant or something like mm. that i think of somebody who's really using their voice as an instrument yeah like does it matter the like the words to rock and roll do they matter yeah not really no nah, no nah. it's the ah, it's it's his yeah. it's his vocal quality it's the intensity yeah uh but but like somebody like Bob Dylan, I mean, he, he obviously has a vocal quality that is very important <laughs> yes, to his does. practice, and he is yeah. using it as an instrument. Yeah. But his words very much do matter. Yeah. Like he's writing a song. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What is are the words? I mean, rock and roll is a song. Mm. It is, but yeah. it, I mean, it's definitely a song. But <laughs> but but what is what is Robert Plant doing? Is He's yeah. just rocking out. Yeah, he's, he's I, I another can, guitar, I right? Tell you he's what rock. the words are. Yeah, it's like it's, it's been, been a long, long time, time since, since the rock and roll. And roll. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long, lonely, 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 lonely time. He's like referencing the blues <laughs> and like yeah, he's yeah. Just, he's just being a vibe. Yeah, that's it. But then you look at Bob Dylan and also being a vibe. Yeah, yeah. But the what is the band doing? Like yeah, they're they're playing the song. It, but is that the focus? Are you like? Are you listening to that sick guitar solo on this Bob Dylan yeah. album? Maybe not. You're probably listening to the words that yeah, are in the songs. Yeah, yep. yeah and, and he kind of came from that folk tradition a little bit more, and, and folk is so huge on yes. the stories. Absolutely. Just yep. like country and, yep. and blues and stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah, man. Mm-hmm. Well, that's cool. I mean, so, so you do a lot of work in a lot of different different areas is there anything else do you teach also you, you yeah. brought that up oh yeah you need that bread and butter um yeah i i, I teach uh at this great elementary school uh yeah. roosevelt elementary and um it's actually this this huge program it's called music immersion experience okay and um they brought it to the school because you know they were having like discipline issues and bad oh. test scores and stuff so it was it was kind of a rough school dang and so they got a grant from the district to do something about it, and they got a music program, and every kid at the school gets a music class. Oh. From TK, like four and five. Amazing. Up to That's fifth great. grade. Yeah, every kid. And then, uh, and after that, there's also electives they can uh-huh. do afterwards. Um, so it's this huge program, and it's it's been so great. You know, mm-hmm. it's been going for, I think we're about to go into our eighth year. Uh-huh. It, was, it was only a grant for five years, but after that was up, they... Wow. Didn't want to let it go. So we're we're still going and um yeah, it's it's been really great because I've I've taught every level uh-huh. aside from college. I, right. I taught high school first uh-huh. when I was in my undergrad and then uh, or I taught some middle school before that and I well don't want to go back. Uh-oh. I just finished another like one off year teaching middle school kids just percussion. And, uh-huh. It's, that's just a rough time. It was a bad time yep, for me. Yep, it's a yep. bad time for them. Yep. I'm not going to like force them to <laughs> learn paradiddles. Like, yep. They're just trying to you know, not get not picked Not learn on. paradiddles? Yeah, a lot of stuff uh, <laughs> other than that. But um, yeah, so the elementary school, man, it's, it's kind of rekindled like my love for, for teaching a little bit. Because when I was teaching high school, um, there was a lot of fun parts about it, but... The thing that really bummed me out is that like some of these students I was working with were doing their last year of, of playing music or like oh. of even, you know, in doing anything with music. Whoa. Because, yeah, some of those kids are going off to college the next year and like, you know, doing other very important things. Right. But, you know, it, it was really tough for me to like, you know, motivate them to, you know, oh, like this, these two measures here, like you really need to like practice your right hand this thing to to make that happen right right but it's like you know they're after this concert they're not doing it ever again so i like i kind of lost my motivation and the thing that really killed Mm -hmm. it was like some days i would show up and like kind of the the bad part of teaching some of these high schools is like there's always you know there's at least a couple kids that are that don't want to be there yep and that are going to make your life miserable because they don't want to be there and I like I'm. That's my my job is to be there to motivate these kids yep. and mm-hmm. get get them to do this right, thing. Right. And so I'm there and I'm pushing these kids to practice and like working and trying to figure out all these ways yeah. that mm-hmm. like how am I going to fix this? How am I going to help this kid work through yeah. this this bit of music? And I would finish that and I would 
get into the practice room and I'd have nothing left for myself. Right. Yeah. I would just have no energy yeah, to like absolutely. motivate myself to fix this mm-hmm. thing, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so that was killing me. And that's when I kind of said like, okay, I, I, next year I'm going to grad school cause I cannot just, I felt like I was kind of trading water, you yep. know, cause I was, I was playing, I was working here and there. I was doing musicals and playing just a little bit of orchestra stuff. Yeah. Um, but I just knew that if I just stayed at that course, I didn't think I would go very far. Yeah. And so that's when I just told myself like, I need to just take a big gamble and spend a bunch of money and go to grad school, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and it, I, I don't think that it paid off because great. After, after I did that and, and I had that great summer, uh-huh. um, I forget if I talked about this on the podcast or not, cause we uh-huh. were talking before, but, um, in between my two years at BU, yeah. that's where yes. I like, Oh, we, we did, did talk- start with this. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. We cool. did. We did. All right. So that was, you can do was, it again. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it was that good. Yeah. Um, but after that, I came back and, and that was the year that Long Beach had the audition and I went out wow. and I won so it. So it all lined up. That's yeah. I, I, I'm a very lucky guy. Like, <laughs> yeah, no idea. But, um, nice. yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, I, I really think that, nice. you know, taking that big gamble, which I hadn't really done before. Yeah. Um, you know, I like to think that it paid off and, um, and, and, you know, I got in with the elementary school at the same time. And, okay. Uh, yeah, and, and and that's the thing. I didn't even get to this part. This is my favorite thing about teaching elementary school is, you know, they're, it's so fresh, uh-huh. especially with I teach the TK, the youngest kids mm-hmm. there, four and five. And you come in with the triangle, and they're like, what's that? Yep. You know, you don't know the magic of a triangle it's, it's crazy. Uh, until you come in and there's a bunch of kids like, what is that? I'm like, oh, well, let me tell you. <laughs> Ding. <laughs> and they're like, whoa, they lose it. And it, it's just such a blast. I come out of teaching there and I'm like even more motivated because then wonderful. I come here and I'm like, my triangle. <laughs> like, it know? is amazing. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's, it's really great. I, I highly recommend, you know, elementary teaching is as crazy as it can be there. There's all, all of course, frustrating moments too, sure. but, um, just, uh, you know, seeing musicians get started, uh-huh. you know, cause even if just like two or three of those kids that I've taught in yeah. TK or second grade go on to play, mm-hmm. I will feel amazing because they're, they're off to a great start, like way better than me. So, uh, yeah, that part's pretty cool. Nice. I really like I that. mean, what I love hearing about it is so many musicians are like, yeah, I'm teaching and it's like this grind. It's what you're talking about. Yeah. It takes everything out of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so like, it's awesome to hear that you found, uh, a way to, to incorporate teaching, which I actually think is an important piece of musical practice. It's like the giving back. I think that's how I justify my like importance to society. Yes. Like, um, cause yeah, you know, even if they don't go on to play, there's so much just like, like other activities like sports and things. It's like, there's so much you learn about being, um, a good person, mm-hmm. you know, that you can learn from music. And it's true. Yeah. And, and as musicians, we have, we have a technical side too. We're not just the artifice that's on stage. We're not just a show. We're in the practice room too. And it allows us to share that aspect of our lives with other people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. So yeah, the, there are good teaching gigs out there. You just have to, <laughs> you just have to find them. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm really happy with this elementary school. And, and there were some high schools that I loved, like I would have stayed for a long time, but um, going out to Boston was really like, okay, I got to just cut it off clean and yeah. did that. But it was for the best at the end. But Nice. That's yeah. great. Yeah, man. Cool. Do you want to try playing something? Uh, ooh, um, yeah, before I do that, I have uh, like a little a trick that I want to show oh, everybody. Oh, yeah, please. Um, so uh, a friend told me about this. He was studying at Cleveland Institute, and um, nice. he talked about this this class that or this this thing he would do with his yeah. teacher this uh, percussionist and he he called this cosmic whole note and so so i, I want to see if, if okay. you actually want to try yeah uh, anthony so um so here's 140 okay right? okay so i'm gonna turn it on and i'm gonna put it on just a whole note okay so the idea is you just clap on the on the downbeat right so okay. one two three four
pretty good, right? You just you're subdividing <laughs> your head. Yeah. And it gets harder when you do it slower. So this, right, of course. Let's go to like let's find a happy. Let's go to like eighty. Nice. So I'll, I'll put it on. I'll put it on the. So this is every beat. Mm hmm. Get a feel for that. All right, <laughs> and and now we'll go to only the whole notes. Four, one, two, three, four. Oh. I'm a little early. Ah! Oh. So, it, this is tough, man. Uh, my teacher... That's great. Yeah, it's it's a thing that... So, my, my orchestra lesson guy that I've been studying with, the student Ken McGrath, who's... Mm -hmm. like been my favorite teacher so far honestly but he he had me doing this with everything i play and he'd just be like okay what tempo is it be like oh it's like 126 is like okay and he'd just put it on the downbeats and i'm like nice well you're really feeling that the clock there yeah 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 that's cool i like that a lot it really gets you subdividing and gets you like actively feeling the time because for percussionists it's easy because our note ends so quick yeah so we're not thinking like a brass player like da yeah um so yeah it's it's a great thing and i feel like it's good for every musician to do because you have time all the time so there you go yeah it's a valuable practice tip yeah yeah anytime Cool. Um, so you want to play something? Sure. Like, what were you Anything. Any, just improvise any instrument uh, you want. Okay. Yeah, all right. I'll get the vibes right here. That's cool. That's nice. Uh, It'll be fun. Okay. We can be weird, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Luther Adams. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
never jammed with a banjo before. Really? That was tight. Nice. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah. You hear me pluck out that? Oh, hoop? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't so know the radio yesterday just like happened. But... Oh, nice. Right on, man. Cool. Oh, so, uh, yeah. So what, what do you got? What do you got coming up? Anything, oh, anything yeah. you want to direct the people to? Oh, man. Um, hmm, actually, yeah, summer's pretty slow right now. Okay, <laughs> yeah, all right. I, I just did a couple of shows recently, but yeah, the, the next Long Beach thing is until August. And, okay, uh, nice. The Bag of Bombs, we may play next week. We may Ooh. play next month. Who knows? Okay, but, all right, all right. Yeah. Well, is there? A, I'll, I'll link to everything. Oh, yeah, d- all of it. Uh, my Instagram. I'd It'll all be in the so. in the description below. Check the description. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Thanks yeah. for playing with me. Thanks hey, for talking thanks for with me today. Out. Yeah, cool. Yeah, awesome, man. <laughs> Thank you. See you, everybody. Bye. All right, thanks for listening or watching. That was Brian Kennedy. Be sure to find him on social media and subscribe and like his stuff. And do the same for me, and I will see you all next time. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.